Well, it is, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Toby Nunn as our next speaker. Toby Nunn is Canadian by birth, and I don't think that I knew that. He was born in northern uh, British Columbia, entered the United States to search for better education opportunities and work, and to earn his place as a citizen, he enlisted in the United States Army as an infantryman. After he came back from Iraq in 2008, he did some nonprofit uh, executive and media work, and he dedicates the majority of his time to Mighty Oaks Warrior Programs, which is a faith-based program that helps veterans struggling with PTS, as well as veterans, uh, Veteran Outdoors, which is a 501c3 that takes returning and injured veterans on their dream outdoor experience. And Joey, who last night uh, through the, the raffle won the big game hunt, Joey's never hunted before. So what you need to do is give him a knife and, and just point him towards a big pig or something and say we're on, because he has no idea what he's, I don't know if he can hear me or not back there, but oh, he's, he did, dang it, he came in. Darn it. So, uh, and as an avid outdoorsman, Toby feels a connection with his service and the cathartic efforts of uh, being and taking veterans outdoors. Last night at that raffle, it, it was way more successful than the, we thought it was going to be because Toby donated the firearm to the raffle. That was a surprise at the last minute. So, man, what a, what a statement about how much he believes in what we're doing. And, and an example of being all in. Toby, welcome. Thanks. Put it in the magic spot there. The, uh, thank you for joining us at the 10 o'clock uh, 10 o'clock trickle. Uh, this is one of the best times of all seminars and conferences to speak. Uh, if you weren't here at 9 o'clock, you missed out. Bryce was phenomenal. and. Uh, Really, really put together a good message. And uh, throughout this, uh, this experience that you're going through, uh, there's, there's going to be some, some hammering of points, some regurgitation of points. A lot of what you're going to hear from me is a, a strong regurgitation. But I want to share with you that how does a mother bird feed their young? Uh, uh, through regurgitation, right? So uh, look forward to that. I had a really long speech prepared, but uh, Carl just said everything about me there is to say, so I will wrap early. But uh, for those of you that don't know me, which is probably almost everybody, I'm probably the least known entity here. Uh, my name is Toby, uh, born and raised in the mountains in northern British Columbia, and uh, where there's not a lot of opportunity for a young man, unless you wanted to be a lumberjack or a professional hockey player. And by regarding me, you can tell that neither of those were in my future. I, had a very, uh, I was raised by a single father, a very understanding father, a very smart man, a very wise man. And uh, when we came on vacation to the United States uh, to race motorcycles or to visit you know, friends and family, we identified that anyone in America that wanted to get an education can. And my father believed in education. He thought it was super crucial. He wanted to have children that graduated from college and went on to do other things, be it a trade or, or something, but he, he felt like you needed to provide value to your community. And he knew that I wasn't smart enough to get into a Canadian school. He wasn't wealthy enough to pay, his, pay my way into a Canadian school, so we facilitated my, uh, my immigration to the United States. Uh, from northern Canada to Alaska is a fairly easy immigration. I can make horrible jokes like it's easier to walk across a frozen river than swim across a flowing one. But you know, it was, uh, it was pretty easy to get in, do the paperwork, do the application process. While in, uh, while in Alaska, I identified that it's cold there. And growing up in Canada and reading like Transworld magazines and stuff like that, I wanted to, to find a sunnier location. And uh, I went from there down to Florida where I, I learned about the sunshine, it's this thing, it rises in the morning, it puts out heat, it's beautiful. <laughs> Something growing up in a rainforest you don't know about, and then there's girls, and they wear less clothing, and it was very attractive to me as a young man. I'm gonna, and I was like, I'm gonna stay here. But when I was 12 or 13, I read a book called Starship Troopers. Anybody? Oh, yeah. Robert Heinlein, right? Or if you watch the movie, like, Rico's Roughnecks. 
but in that, in that book, Starship Troopers, there's a chapter on citizenship and the value of citizenship and how it's not bequeathed to you, it's not inherited, it's earned. And even as a young man reading that book, I felt the power of wanting to be part of my community, not just in it. I wanted to be part of it. And one of the things my father always taught me was, like, put value where you can. So I, I wanted to join the military to earn citizenship. At the time, there was only about 1,500 non-citizens serving. This is in the 90s. There was only about 1,500 non-citizens serving. Uh, the regulations were a little bit different. And what you, benefit you got was actually a discount on your residential time. So there, there wasn't a fast track, except it was faster. Uh, since then, the legislation's changed numerous amounts of time, and uh, it's a lot easier. And I think there's about 42,000 non-citizens serving in our armed forces, earning their way to being part of our society, which I think is pretty cool. My military career uh, is pretty uneventful. Uh, you know, that's what people without tabs say, you know, because, uh, you know, you're always jealous of those that have them. I grew, you know, I've always wanted uh, to be a ranger. I, I look at the ranger community and I have a lot of love for it. I have a lot of respect for it. And uh, I admire it. I admire everyone in special operations. Uh, I think anyone that takes that opportunity to, to challenge themselves more is, uh, is a person of character because they, they've faced adversity and they, they challenge themselves. I, uh, I had a great career. I was really blessed. Things worked out well for me. Uh, unfortunately, due to citizenship, I was kind of limited in some things I could do. And then awkwardly, while deployed in Iraq, my green card expired, and I couldn't redeploy back. Like, it's funny now. <laughs> At the time, it was a little awkward. It was the, you know, they're like doing the manifest, and the MPs are like, so it's kind of a, a felony for us to put you on this paper, so. But my leadership were awesome. They found a, a way to keep me in Iraq. <laughs> It's like, they were, they were awesome. And, uh, <laughs> but it led to a wonderful job that uh, was very entrepreneurial. It was, it was new. It was, you know, for a non-commissioned officer, it was a wonderful opportunity. It expanded my horizons. Uh, but I was looking at having to get out. And it was going to be like almost a forced exit from the military due to the, the regulations of non-citizen serving at the time. So in about 2005, uh, Monster.com was just getting started. I was looking at uh, being forced out. I wrote up a, a really weak resume and I threw it up, you know, into the, the void known as the interwebs. And all these people contacted me. And I was like, oh, this is so simple. This is so easy. Then, you know, the military are like, hey, we found a way, a loophole for you to continue to serve. And I'm like, well, that's what I want to do anyway. So I continued to serve. And then in about 2008, uh, the military came back and said, hey, you know, it's, it's about time. You have to make a decision. And I was facing an indefinite reenlistment. I was a little tired after, you know, multiple rotations. And I, I made the decision to get out because my ego was telling me I could do anything. I was the king of the world. You know, I was a senior NCO. Uh, you know, I thought I was pretty cool. And last time I needed to get out or almost had to get out, I just threw a resume up and People flocked to me, you know, like I was the Pied Piper of employment. It was awesome. But that's not what happened. Uh, I came back, um, and like many, like uh, Bryce was just talking about, I was a hot mess. Um, I was engaged in infidelity. I was engaged in just a, a big lie. My life was a big lie. And uh, I was crash landing into Earth. And part of that's transition, and part of it's just bad behavior and bad choices. And I have to take accountability for the bad choices I made because that wasn't circumstance, that was behavior. But the circumstances weren't that great either. Uh, I had a hard time finding jobs. I didn't know about how to properly do a, a resume and I had to get mentored on how to do it and now there was hyperlinks that you could in include in your thing and there could be a film reel, and there could be a CV. I didn't even know what CV meant. People were like, can I get your CV? Because I had written some things, and I, like, I didn't even know what that meant. I had to like, look it up in a Webster's, because I was like anti-Google at the time. And I found out what that was, 
I, I went to interviews. I'd, I'd done all kinds of boards in the Army. Uh, I was an Audie Murphy member, and I thought that an interview is like going to a board. And if you can get into the interview, you're, you got it. You know, it's like a competition. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, there's a really funny story. Uh, if we're at a bar sometime or you know, somewhere else across the hall, I'll, I'll tell you. But I might, I might have been involved in a felonious assault during a, a job interview. <laughs> and uh, when you realize that's what's happening, you know, like I was like, this went horribly wrong. I need, I, I need, I need to dial it in. And when you go home to your family with a ripped uh, suit and blood on your shirt and your knuckles dusted and your kids are hungry, uh, it's an it's a awful, awful reality. While that was happening, I got uh, in touch with a nonprofit called Soldiers Angels, a wonderful organization that's still going. And uh, the founder of the organization, this lady named Patty Patton Bader, she asked me if I would help do some speaking uh, to some donors and help with some donor development. And uh, I was happy to do that. They treated, my uh, they treated my guys while we were deployed extremely well. Some of my guys that got hurt and injured, they went well, well out of their way, above and beyond what they needed to do to help them. And I was super grateful for that, and I wanted to repay that debt. I felt obliged to pay that debt. While I was doing that, uh, they asked me if I wanted to help with business development. I didn't even know what that meant. But, you know, I, I figured I had to buy some suits, which I did, that I grew out of really fast because I started gaining weight because I didn't stop running. But I learned that all these skills that I had in the military, all these skills that I had from life were really applicable and business development clicked. I started like solving problems, seeing needs, going after it. And all of a sudden, when I was in the army, everything clicked. And I got out, things didn't, you know, I never thought I'd have that click, that connection. Now I'm doing business development and it's going. And as a result of that, they asked me if I wanted to be the director of operations. And I was like, oh man, this is like running an S3 shop. You know, and I was like, ah, and I did it. And it went really, really well. And then they elevated me to executive director. And I was the executive director of a national organization. And I was like, man, this would like really make sense. And I, the nonprofit world, th there's some really wonderful things about it. Similar to the military, it involves noble purpose. And a, perp a person without noble purpose is like a rudderless ship, you know, just adrift in, in, the, in the waves. And that organization, that cause, that premise, put a rudder on my ship, that noble purpose, and I just really, really enjoyed it and thrived in it. And, and it was super exciting. I enjoyed the education process. I enjoyed bettering myself at each elevation that I met. But the nonprofit world uh, can kind of be like barracks life. And you're probably like, what do you mean by barracks life? Uh, what happens when someone brings a pizza to the CQ desk or the staff duty desk? <laughs> There's a lot more mouths than slices, right? Like, Maybe, maybe like a guy checks in a, in a, I lived in all male barracks being infantry, so like if a guy checked in a female guest, all of a sudden everyone wanted to borrow sugar. Uh, <laughs> like everyone wanted to come by and see what you were watching. Like you had more friends than you knew what you needed. The other thing about you know, the nonprofit uh, world is uh, there's a lot of, uh, it's about me. Uh, my Marine friends, I have a really good uh, friend named Matt, uh, Chad Robichaud that starred Mighty Oaks. You know, he's always reminding people, not, be careful the, the Semper I, right? Not the, the Semper Fi, but the Semper I. And uh, it's a lot of ego-driven things and people getting into it for the wrong purposes. And people looking at the nonprofit realm as a source of revenue uh, where you can disguise trying to support yourself versus doing something good. And the other aspect of it is I was a very ambitious and driven person. As you rise up through the ranks in the military, what are you trying to do? Like when I was a private, I was in a mech unit, I call it my dark period. I, uh, I didn't want to use a broom in the, in the motor pool. You know, I didn't want to line up and change track pads on Bradley's. Like that was, I wanted to get above that. 
Um, maybe you, you didn't want to clean toilets or whatever it is. You want to elevate yourself. And they teach you by doctrine to know the person above you's position so that if they fall in battle, you can assume it, right? So you're always trying to learn the next echelon. Well, in the, in the, the situation that I was in, I had reached my ceiling. And I was driven and I was ambitious. And I wanted to do more. I wanted to make more money because I'm greedy. Mainly it's because I have kids and awkwardly, like, they like to eat, like, more than once a day. And if you can tell by this, my family does really well at the table. But <laughs> the, uh, the ability to move on and try new things, and I wanted to expand and learn and continue to grow because I really became addicted to the success of moving through all these different processes and mechanisms. And I wanted to, like, continue that and thrive at it. Made the decision. Uh, to get into entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is, is uh, going to bat. How, how many times can you get, get up to bat and what's your, your hitting average, right? In, in baseball, I'm Canadian, so forgive me if I disrespect your national pastime. I, I think if you hit 30%, you're like pretty much a stud and you're in the history books and Hall of Famer, right? Is that about right? Right, so entrepreneurship's kind of like that, right? It's, it's, fine. it's seeing a, a, a gap it's finding a hole and plugging it. You know, in about 2008, 2009, maybe 2010, a bunch of guys coming out of the military found that there was an epidemic of bear's chests. And you know, like, what does an entrepreneur when he do when he sees the thing and he sees that there's people walking around shirtless? They come up with shirt companies. Where's Nick at? Right? I, I love Nick, he's like one of my favorite guys on the earth. Uh, I, I love wearing his product, but I was scared, like, you know, people would be like, oh, Ranger, you a Ranger? And then I'd have to, like, try not to, like, have a stolen valor moment. So I'm grateful for Vinny, and the boys come up with Article 15, because that's not stolen valor. I had at least one of those. So, but, you know, just like the wild beard hairs and, you know, the empty cups of coffee, you know, people in our community, like, that seems to, like, be a big thing. But finding that, that gap, that hole, and doing it, is wonderful and that, that problem solving and, and that's the part of the mission planning process. This is what we're all trained to do. This is simple, it makes sense. And one of the things it also does is it allows me personally uh, to make money in one area and use my time, treasure and talents over here so I can leverage them over here. And that's really what I wanna talk to you about today is leveraging your time, your treasure, and your talents. One of the most important things that you have is time and where you spend it, where you invest your time. Vinny and I were talking about this yesterday and you know, like if you're not spending time and being present with your kids, you're not being a parent. There's more to being a parent than providing you know, sustenance. You gotta provide that, that spiritual nourishment. You gotta provide that leadership in your home. And that takes time, that takes being present. Like, Bryce was saying earlier about the uncomfortable situation. It's putting the, the iPad out of their hands with Netflix and being present and doing that stuff, being uncomfortable. Your treasure, you know, your, your treasure is not just your money. You know, the treasures are the resources that you have around you, the resources that you can utilize. I have one of the best treasures in the world. It's one of my, uh, I like to call her one of my besties. She's in this room and that's Candace. Like, that's a treasure to me because we're able to do things and accomplish things with people because like, we have resources that we can use that are outside of money, their connections, their relationships, and there are talents. Like everyone in this room has an amazing talent. I, like, I got a little fanboyish the other night, I got a little starstruck, you know, Leo here is over there looking cool with the white shirt. You know, like, that's a talented, talented man. This is a room of talented individuals. You know, Daniel Eric's here, like talented people. And it's just impressive. And you can leverage that for good. Now, charity. What is charity? Charity, by definition, is generosity. Generosity is to give without usury. Usury is what? Like, what's in it for me? The, the whipham, or whatever they call it. And when you're able to, like, leverage that for good... Like, wonderful things can happen. So say you, you have a product or you have a, an idea and you want to do it. You know, your friends can show you love and support 
by investing in it. But they're investing in you because they love you. And that's what Nick was talking about last night at dinner. Everyone remember Nick last night? You know, outside the astronaut comment, I got really excited because I wasn't sure if that was true or false. But, you know, don't surround yourself with losers. You know, surround yourself with people that love you and they're going to put value into your life. And when you do that, you know, people will stay up till midnight when you launch that new, you know, rugby line and try and be the first customer. Not because they're rugby fans, because they're a fan of you and they're investing in you. And you're leveraging that because it's a treasure of yours. But it's not an entitlement. And one of the problems we have in our community, and this is like so frustrating for me, it like honestly it disgusts me at times, is that we like to hold things ransom, like the outcomes of our service, to benefit us. And, and that's, that's not in keeping with why we raised our hands. That's not in keeping with why we signed our names. Like, you shouldn't be like some sleazy salesman like going, are, are you tired of paying retail for your freedom? Have I got a deal for you? Or like, you know, I gave this, so you owe me that. Like, that, that's not leveraging, that's ransoming. Like, don't, don't ransom your neighbor's freedom for your personal gain. Like, look at how you can utilize your time, treasure, and talents to add value, put value into, into the community and into things. The other thing I wanted to share before I tell a little story is when you're surrounding yourself with folks, take your blinders off. Look at people, not by what they wore, but what and who they are. Uh, Bryce just said a, a wonderful comment. This is one of the regurgitations. Civilians are not the enemy. In fact, uh, I'll tell you, all the ventures that I engaged in and partnerships entrepreneurially with civilians have been tremendous successes. Uh, and some of the ones where I partnered with battle buddies weren't that good. Part of the reasons were the uncomfortable talk and you know, trying to beat a square peg into a round hole. Like, surround yourself with people that are going to put value into your life and you can put value into yours. It should be mutually beneficial. It should be an exchange of value, not like taking it. Live, live your life not like a little mind bot trying to get cryptocurrency. Like, try and add value and partner yourself with people that are good for it. Like, when you're building your team, like any fantasy football players in here? Any closet fantasy football players in here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, when, when you're building your team, when you're drafting that team and you're trying to level it up, you're, you're not, like, looking at who's the weakest link. Now, I'm, I'm guilty. I will pick people out of loyalty. I, I play uh, fantasy hockey. Um, but I'll pick people out of loyalty. You know, there's a couple Vancouver Canucks on my roster. It's true. They might not be the best player, but I've picked them out of loyalty and because I love them. But for the most part, if I'm trying to be successful, I'm picking the appropriate people and I'm looking past, you know, what they did in uniform or if they were not in uniform. I'm looking at their spirit. I'm looking at their character. And there's a lot, I'd rather be judged on looking at people's character than saying, well, this dude, he had three, three tabs. He was pretty cool. Uh, he, he graduated three schools. That doesn't make him a man of character. And of course, everyone's going to say, Toby, you don't have a tab. That's why you say that. You know, the, the, but I believe that, and, and utilize that in any, any, oper any uh, circumstance. But I want to I share with you quickly uh, a little thing about Texas. Because, like Carl said, I am, uh, I am Canadian. I'm still a green card carrying uh, Canadian. But I've been commissioned a Texan. I have a, like a declarations official. I got to stand there with my hand up. There was a flag. It was like, there was celebratory fire afterwards. Uh, it, was like a, it was like a real ceremony. But here, here in Texas, uh, we have a problem with an invasive plant. And it's the cedar plant. All right? The cedar plant uh, is not native to Texas. And interesting fact, it can suck up to 50 gallons of water per day, a single cedar tree, can extract 50 gallons of water out of the soil daily. 
my wife's in water conservation, so like I get all these cool little water facts all the time, and that's why I really enjoyed the message yesterday about water and, 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 and words. But this tree just robs the soil of water. And what do all plants need? What is Texas, with the exception of the past month, typically short on? Water, right? So here you have this plant that comes into the land, spreads prolifically, and extracts all the water out of the earth. In addition to taking all the water out of the earth, in that exchange of life that's happening with that tree, it's discharging an extremely high acid content, poisoning poisoning all that's below it and around it so that the only thing that can grow near it or with it is itself. All right? Think about that. In contrast, it, native to Texas is this wonderful plant called the live oak. And the live oak is a slow-growing hardwood it's not a fast, rapid-growing softwood like the cedar. It's a slow-growth hardwood that does not take more than it needs out of the earth. It takes only what it needs to survive and slightly grow. In addition to that, it does not discharge anything acidic. It actually adds additional nutrients underneath it. So animals all parts of the ecosystem can come and seek shade because it, does it get sunny here? It gets a little warm, right? Where do you see cows? Under the trees, right? They go there because they can seek shade. There's also nourishment because the, uh, the, the soil underneath is fertile and it grows and you can, they can eat it. It's this wonderful ecosystem that happens because of the oak tree. Look at your life, look at your community, and look at what you can leverage and what value you can put into it, and then think to yourself, am I a cedar tree or am I an oak tree? Oak trees live hundreds of years and leave a lasting legacy. One's a ferocious, nasty, acidic weed. And if that doesn't help sell it for you, in the movie Tombstone, a great quote. Did Wyatt Earp get called a cedar tree or an oak tree? Doc Holliday said, Wyatt, you're an oak. Be an oak tree. Be a mighty one. I'm Toby.